but then an aspiring Asian youth such as Wang Zhu in the beginning of the 20th century saw his country experiencing 300 years of deterioration and humiliation wanted to have intellectual bravery. That's where it comes from. There is no question that to build a world-class university in the 21st century, especially as the nation's flagship university, producing generations of alumni with intellectual bravery is a must. Producing intellectual bravery student is another mark of world class. In NCKU, I always say, if we don't maintain Tzu Wang as its pride, it's equivalent to Cambridge University does not maintain Newton or Maxwell as its pride. Now the last one is cultural importance. I am a, I read, ever since I became an administrator, I started to read what other administrators have said. And the statement that truly touched me in my heart ever since I came to Asia is the one by Charles Eliot, who was Harvard's president between 1869 and 1909. 1869, as you know, is right after U.S. Civil War. He said something the following. A university, in any worst sense of the term, must grow from seed. It must be transplanted from England or Germany in full leaf and bearing. When the American university appears, it will not be a copy of foreign institutions or a hotbed plant, but the slow and natural outgrowth of American social and political habits. The American college is an institution without parallel. The American university will be equally original. Let me replace some of the words here. Just replace Germany with the United States and America with Asia Pacific. This would be the same for us today. That's how important this statement is, at least to me. So, what is Asian Pacific social and political habits that NCKU is embedded in? You, in Malaysia, you have a different political and social habits but you must also make sure that you embed that in that. So I asked myself that question the day I arrived in NCKU. I used the following. History and my life experience, like a lighthouse, are my guides. It starts with my life in Singapore. You know, in Singapore, people speak Hokkien. And in Taiwan, they tell me they speak Taiwanese. I said, wait a minute. Singapore's wakalikong, which means I tell you so, is identical to Taiwan's wakalikong. <laughs> so what is the difference? Here is Taiwan. And here is Fujian province. And you can see that's the mainland, and that's Taiwan. And right here, Kimoi, by the way, even today, is still part of the Republic of China. It's still part of the government of the Republic of China. It's right inside on the shore, six kilometers away from Xiamen. This is how close they are. That's Kimoi and that's Xiamen. And this island belongs to the mainland China. This is Taiwan. This is 1.6 kilometers. You grab a bicycle, you grab a two basketball, you can swim across. <laughs> and people have done so. Now what have these two gentlemen got to do with it? Kennedy and Nixon. Well, in the third debate of Kennedy and Nixon in 1916, October 13, Kui Moi and Matsu became world famous. What did happen? It was mentioned 16 times. One of them I'll, I'll let you go Google it and read it yourself. One of them said that Kui Moi should be kept within the Republic of China. The other one said no. So I'll let you get, decide which one said what. But the point is it was mentioned. 
And then I started to learn about the history of this little island. The first era is when the great Confucianist Zhu Xi went to that whole area and created an intellectual ambience, which it lasted even today. In Chinese history, that little island produced what is called 40 Jing Si, which is the highest examination people that came out of that little island. And in 1956, during the Song Dynasty, Zhu Xi established Yan, Yannan College in Quimoy. It preceded Oxford and Cambridge by 36 and 54 years. And the second era is by this great patriot at the end of the Ming Dynasty called Chen Chen Gong. And that, by the way, is the name of our university, Chen Gong University. When I went to national, Chen Gong, by the way, in Chinese means success. So I was thrilled. This is so strange. How can a university's name be success? <laughs> that makes no sense at all. And finally, I realized it has nothing to do with success. It has to do with the name of the patriot, Zhen Chen Gong. That's 400 years ago. And the third era is at the end of the Qing Dynasty when the Fujian province people just couldn't live anymore. Their life was so hard, they migrated in a very harsh manner down to Southeast Asia. And that's why today in Southeast Asia you see all this. In fact, we met one of the great Cremonian yesterday uh, at dinner, uh, Mr. Yo Tiong Lei. Xiamen, Quimoy, and Tainan, which was the root for Zhen Chen Gong's effort, became the core cities for the Mingnan or Southern Fujian culture. And it impacted the entire East and Southeast Asia. And the very fourth era is very interesting too, is the communist Kuomintang confrontation since 1949. From war to co-war to peace to however you want to imagine. Quimoy, by the way, in Chinese means golden gate, Jingmen. We all know that in the 20th century, golden gate bridge sig signals the ascendancy of North America's intellectual and economic power. You look at that bridge and you can sense the North American power. There is now talk about building the 21st century Golden Gate Bridge between Quimoy and the mainland. And I believe that 21st century Golden Gate Bridge signifies, well, signifies Asians' rise. So what does that all that tell me? It tells me that people like Zhu Xi and Zhen Cheng Gong transcend time and space. They motivated me to think about the importance of culture. And in this case, Chinese. Not China. Chinese culture. And that the Chinese culture is eternal. Great universities with this culture need to build the greatness on such underpinnings. And that's why whenever, when, when I went to National Chen Gong University, I spent a huge amount of time talking to our, our humanity school and propel them, work with them, and let them go from already very, very good to quite great today. So 20th century, I mentioned earlier, 19th century, we saw the rise of the intellectual power of Europe. Uh, of Europe. But 20th century, we saw the rise of the intellectual and economic power of North America, especially the United States. Why? Because of two events in the first half of the 20th century, First and Second World War. When Europe and Asia were turned upside down by World War I and World War II, North America was like a castle protected by a secured moat. And that moat is called the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. For the same reason why Japanese did not attack San Francisco but Honolulu instead, it's because they just couldn't get there. So they were protected by the Pacific Ocean. And what happened because of this, of this stability in North America? Lock, stock and barrel of the very best people that came out of 300 years of Renaissance 
move to North America. People, the most famous one is Albert Einstein and many, many others. And two medicine people, one of them Lippmann, the other one Bloch, went to North America and won Nobel Prizes there. Musicians, Heifetz, Stern, went to North America. Ludwig Wies Man van der Rohe, a great architect of the, uh, of, of the early 20th century, went to North America. This injection of this intellectual power could not have happened without World War I and World War II. Imagine that if United States, if World War I and World War II didn't exist, and these guys were all in Europe, and U.S. universities would have to go there and recruit them over, imagine how difficult that would be. So, this is what happened in North America. So such a massive transplantation of intellects from Europe to North America brought U.S. universities from dormant to brilliance. By the way, in the 19th century, I looked into the history of physics, and I asked, who is the great physicist in the United States? And the only one that I could come up with was Gibbs, who was a great thermodynamics man. He was at Yale University, but that was it. So, in merely 50 years, it redefined many U.S. universities to be the hallmark of excellence. It made Americans, especially young Americans, develop inherent self-confidence. So, 19th century is Europe. 20th century is North America. 21st century, is it Asia? We have heard often, almost to the point of being a cliché, the 21st century belongs to Asia. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if Asians, especially young Asians, do not develop inherent self-confidence, just like the youth of Europe and North America developed theirs in the 19th and 20th century, respectively, will the 21st century truly be that of Asia? The 20th century went through a tremendous transformation. I wanted to find one PowerPoint to illustrate this transformation. And finally, I found it in the Nobel Prize in Literature. We all know that the very first Nobel laureate of Asian is not, was not a scientist. In fact, he was the great Indian uh, literary expert named Tagore. It was in 19, 1913 he won it. And when you win the Nobel Prize, they give you one little byline. And the byline for him said, express in his own English words a part of the literature of the West. They didn't say he was a great Indian literary expert. They say that he's a part of the literature of the West. To me, this is a naked colonial statement. And yet in 2000, the very last year of the, Nobel, of, of the 20th century, Gao Xingjian, won the Nobel Prize again. And you see the byline for him has opened new paths for the Chinese novel and drama. A complete change of language. This is very important. In the closing comment at a conference of global financial crisis of industrial re restructuring, I, I was asked to give a, a, a summary. And I scratched my head. I said, wait a minute. I'm not an economist. I'm not, I'm not even an engineer. I'm not a lawyer. How can I possibly say anything here? So finally, I asked myself the question, what is the difference between this particular global financial crisis with that of the past in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and the 1990s? I asked myself, and finally I figured out. I say that all the others, India and China, could be economic powers. This one, India and China, are economic powers. So I thought of a term called psychologically de psychological decoupling, and I'll tell you what that means. Throughout the 20th century, and this is what I said, Asia was psychologically coupled to the West, and understandably so, with superior economic and intellectual strengths. It is quite natural that Asia viewed the West as the standard of excellence. However, such a period as this with the West so palpably exposing its social and economic weaknesses. 
this may be the first time in the modern global history, economy, that Asia can psychologically decouple from the West. This is not to suggest that Asia should decouple economically and intellectually from the West. Rather, I'm talking about psychological decoupling to undo a sense of reliance on the West, without which it is unlikely that Asia will develop a deep sense of inherent self-confidence and without which the 21st century is surely not to be the Asian century. So can Asian universities do this for their students, for their young people, just as Europe and North America did? I also said at the end of the Shanghai Jiao Tong Conference in 2005 about world-class universities, I said the following. There was a very great president of Peking University in the early 20th century, and his name is Cai Yuanpei. And I said, indeed, with Cai's leadership, Peking University became not just the soul of Chinese universities, but in fact, Chinese history and culture of the 20th century. How do we measure the intangible impact of Peking University and the culture of China? With Bai Hua, the so-called modern Chinese movement, May 4th movement, and so on. Is it even logical to consider Peking University not a world-class university when it has profound impact on Chinese culture with nearly quarter humanity for a century? And this is something we need to think about. I'm confident, however, that together we can achieve this great mission of the 21st century. And that's why, as I come back to Charles Dickens, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. It was a witness, win winter of despair. And so thank you, Mr. Dickens, who predicted 150 years ago with such vivid words to describe the uh, Asia Pacific in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Feng Daswan, for his talk this morning. We would like now to open the floor for Q&A sessions. Should anyone have any questions, kindly step up to the microphone located on the left or the right of this hall. Thank you. Uh -oh. Thank you so much, Prof. Feng, for a very, uh, how shall I say, inspiring uh, talk. Can I just uh, very quickly ask you, could you share with us how did National Chung Kong University propel itself and to become one of the top universities in the world today? Thank you. Uh, one of the things I, the first thing I went to uh, National Chung Kong University was to learn about his history because we have to know how the university evolved. And therefore, we can follow the trajectory, in a sense. Just to give you a very, very brief history, in 1931, the university, which was created by the Japanese colonialists in 1931, as a very, very low-level engineering technology school, until 1945, it remained that way. When the Japanese left, the Chinese came in, and of course, the Civil War started, the university continued or hobble on without any change. In other words, there was no change of mindset between 1931 until 1950. Mindset was what is necessary we need to inject a sense of uncomfortability, I'm not sure there's such a word, but you know what I mean, into the system. That level of uncomfortability or incomfortability came in 1950, when the U.S. recognized that the communists were coming. So they put a huge amount of money into an agency called the Agency for International Development, AID. And universities in the United States could go get this, apply for these funds, 
and worked with an Asian university and, and Purdue University for, for, bless his heart, uh, 